This is continuing coverage of the trial of Karen Reed from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Now, back to the courtroom. Court's open, you may be seated. 22117, the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Can I counsel? Identify. Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Lally. Good morning, Your Honor. Lara McLaughlin for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Alan Jackson for Ms. Reed. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning, Your Honor. Elizabeth Little also for Ms. Reed. Good morning, Ms. Little. And good morning, David Yanetti for Karen Reed. Good morning, Ms. Yanetti. Good morning, Ms. Reed. All right, counsel wanted to see me? I, I did, Your Honor. Uh, okay. Judge, as I indicated in uh, an email that uh, I sent to your clerk last night and copied right. the Commonwealth. I have not seen the email. Okay, well, I'll explain what was in it. Uh, essentially, I was alerting the court that I would like to be heard prior to the start of testimony today uh, because since Katie McLaughlin testified uh, on Thursday and Friday, we received a, a deluge of photographs that put her with Caitlin Albert on many different occasions after they graduated high school. We received uh, information from their high school yearbook that they were more than just acquaintances in high school. They were teammates on the track team. And even after I sent that email with the photographs that I attached to it, late last night we received uh, another photo where Katie McLaughlin and Caitlin Albert are standing next to each other in a photo at a baby shower in June of 2021, about eight months before John O'Keefe's death. Uh, it, it's very clear to us that Katie McLaughlin perjured herself. And I wanted to discuss the issue of the admissibility of not only the photographs that we're now providing that we just received over the weekend, but I also want to resurrect the admissibility of H, I, J, and K for identification. And uh, I think a, a discussion of this, Your Honor, needs to start with what court orders are currently in place. Uh, the leading case with regard to the provision of reciprocal discovery when the defense is offered... Oh, so so you, you want to get back to Rule 14, the Rule 14 issue? It is a Rule 14 issue. Okay. That's supplemented so, uh, hold by on one second. So on top of that, we can discuss this later. I'd like to get the trial started. Um, that's that's fine, Your Honor. We just, I, my, my belief, my strong belief is that we need to de determine this today. And the reason is that Caitlin Albert is coming up as a witness for the Commonwealth. Um, she faces the same areas of cross-examination that Katie McLaughlin faced. And these photos are relevant to her cross-examination. Okay. All right. So uh, aside from the Rule 14 issue, I also think this is cumulative. I don't have the email. I do have the photos, but we can address this. When do you expect um, the Albert? I'm sorry. What's, what's, what's her name? Caitlin Albert. Caitlin Albert. Um, I'd say midweek, probably. It, it depends on how far we All get right. today. So we'll address this either today or tomorrow. Thank you. Um, scheduling purposes. So, um, Sergeant Link, is he testifying today? Yes, Ron. All right. So we need a voir dire of him. I expect that might take a while. Um, is he testifying this morning, or can we use the lunch break for that? I need oh. to know if we, if it's around eleven o'clock. We'll have a voir dire. I'll just order coffee. I just need to know about that. So I, I anticipate two witnesses prior to him. Uh, so I, I, again, I can't predict necessarily how long. How long will you be with those two witnesses? With those two witnesses, probably half hour, maybe a little more with each. Okay. Any idea how long the cross will be with those witnesses? Probably. I will handle one of those witnesses. Mr. Gennetti will handle the other. And I would say at least a half an hour on cross-examination, maybe a little bit more. Okay. Would it be up to an hour on each? I'm just, again, scheduling. I, I'm not limiting you at all. I'm just curious. Thank you. I I don't think we've exceeded an hour. Um, I would say safely. I know that's a it's a big range, but between a half an hour and, and and an hour, I think for each of them. Okay, I think that's probably accurate. All right. Um, what can I say for a second?
All right. Thank you. So we will all set to bring the jurors in? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Jim. Maybe. Jimmy. We also have exhibit book eight. Eight. Thank you. have any business before the Honorable Beverly Canoni, Justice of the Norfolk Superior Court in and for the County of Norfolk. Draw near, give your attendance, and you shall be heard. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This court is now open. You may be seated. Good morning again, counsel. Good morning again, Ms. Reed. Good morning, Jared. I have to ask you those same three questions, and I appreciate your patience. We had to worked out a few things this morning. So um, was everyone able to follow the instructions and refrain from discussing this case with anyone? Yes. Yes. Everyone said yes and nodded affirmatively. Were you also able to follow the instructions and refrain from doing any independent research or investigation into this case? Um, I'm going to ask you if you were able to refrain from seeing or reading or hearing anything about this case since we left the other day. So I, um, with that, I'm going to see counsel at sidebar and um, be mindful of the step up. Morning. Morning. You saw this with the evidence you give the court and during the case down here and should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lally, whenever you're ready. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Could you uh, please state your name and spell your last name? Yes, my name is Paul Gallagher, last name G-A-L-L-A-G-H-E-R. And uh, how are you employed, sir? I'm a lieutenant with the Camp Police Department. And how long in total have you been a member of the Camp Police Department? A uh, total of 32 years, uh, two years as a permanent intermittent officer, 30 years full-time. 
And uh, you indicated that you are a lieutenant, is that correct? That is correct. And how long have you held the rank of lieutenant? I was promoted to lieutenant August 1st of 2021. What did you do with the Canada Police prior to becoming a lieutenant? Uh, I was the detective sergeant from 2018 until I was promoted in 2021. And what is it, just starting with that, what is, what is it that a detective sergeant does? Uh, so when um, a patrolman takes an initial report, uh, anything that needs uh, follow-up, the detective sergeant makes sure it's assigned to a detective, uh, usually the next detective working, uh, and make sure that uh, all the steps are uh, taken to uh, manage the cases to bring it to fruition, if possible. And uh, what is it, sort of, what are your general duties and responsibilities as a lieutenant with Ken? Uh, currently, uh, they are, I am in charge of internal affairs, uh, background checks, uh, patrol, and I oversee detectives. You say currently, what, what was the problem? Uh, I was promoted in 2021. Uh, at that time, Lieutenant Kelleher was the uh, lieutenant in charge of detectives. Uh, we have since had a change of police and our assignments have changed. Uh, <clears throat> Were you working with Cannon Police on the morning of January 29th, 2022? I was. And uh, at some point, did you receive a phone call? I did. And uh, about what time was that and who, who called? That was uh, after, shortly after 6 a.m. It was uh, Sergeant Sean Good. And he's a member of your department as well? He is. He's the 12 to 8 supervisor, uh, which our shifts actually run 11.45 p.m. to 7.45 a.m., but we call it the 12 to 8 shift. And what, if anything, was indicated to you in this call from Sergeant Good? Uh, Sergeant Good told me he was responding to a scene where a party was found unconscious, possibly not breathing in the snow. Uh, he stated his name was John O'Keefe. He was a Boston police officer who resided on Meadows Ave. Uh, he further told me that he had gotten a call earlier about uh, John O'Keefe not returning home that night. Uh, his friends had called the hospitals. Then they called the police. Then they went out and looked for him, and they found him uh, unconscious and not breathing in the snow. And based on that information, what, if anything, did you? I told him I would respond. Uh, where, did, where were you initially responding? I, I was initially responding to Meadows Ave. I, I misinterpreted when he said he was a, a Boston police officer uh, on Meadows Ave. I, I thought they discovered him on Meadows Ave. But subsequently, did you learn uh, a different location in response to that location? I did. What was that location that you subsequently uh, determined was where you were going? When I called the uh, dispatch to find out the exact address, I was told it was 32 Fairview Road. And that was from the dispatch, is that correct? That's correct. It was Officer Dever who answered the phone. That would be Officer Kelly Dever, is that correct? That is correct. Now, did you go uh, straight from home to the scene, or did you go stop somewhere else prior to I stopped at uh, Canton Police Department prior to that. And what was the purpose of stopping at Canton Police Department prior to going to Fairview? I was picking up some winter gear, and I advised Sergeant Good via the radio that all midnight personnel was to be held till further notice. And you say winter gear. As far as you're responding uh, to a scene, what, if any, other sort of equipment did you uh, procure when you went to Canton Police? I, it was clothing. I, I needed a winter jacket, hat, uh, things of that nature. I was responding in my personal vehicle. And if you know about what time was it that you arrived uh, on Fairview Road that morning? I arrived uh, shortly after 7 a.m. And when you arrived, what, if anything, was it that you observed upon your arrival? Uh, there were some vehicles pulling away, but parked uh, by the where the scene was were three Canton police vehicles and one black Toyota pickup truck that is assigned to our detectives. And who, if anyone else uh, from your department was, was there at that time? When I arrived, uh, the three mocked uh, units were occupied by Officer Mullaney, Officer Sarif, uh, Sergeant Good, and the Toyota pickup was uh, driven there by Detective Sergeant Lank. And as far as um, by the time you arrived, Mr. O'Keefe is no longer on scene, is that correct? That is correct. And uh, what if any uh, vehicles or apparatus or any uh, personnel from the fire department were on scene by the time that you arrived? Uh, none.
Now, when you first arrive, or if anyone did you first sort of speak with uh, on? I first encountered Sergeant Good. And uh, you had a conversation with him, is that correct? That is correct. And who, if anyone else, did you talk to now? Uh, Sergeant, Detective Sergeant Lank joined us as well. <clears throat> and following these initial conversations with Sergeant Good and Detective Sergeant Lank, what did you, what did you do with that? Uh, once they t updated me on the case, uh, we decided that uh, we had a process uh, where Mr. O'Keefe was found. It was uh, snowing heavily. Sometimes the wind was blowing north. Sometimes it was south. Uh, it was changing directions. Uh, and we discussed how to process where Mr. O'Keefe was found, because at the time we had no idea uh, how he came to be where he was. And with respect to that, um First, as far as where Mr. O'Keefe was, who, if anyone, directed you to, to where Mr. O'Keefe had been prior to your arrival? When I arrived and I spoke with Sergeant Good and uh, Detective Sergeant Lank, uh, they updated me on the case. They had told me that uh, Mr. O'Keefe was transported to the hospital, that he they were doing CPR on him at that time. Uh, they told me that he was uh, bleeding from the mouth and nose and that uh, he may have had swelling above one of his eyes. Uh, they uh, told me that uh, they transported uh, his girlfriend as well, and they told me the circumstances surrounding that incident. Uh, they told me that uh, at some point after the phone call to the police station, friends, uh, I, the woman's name was Kerry Roberts, picked up Ms. McCabe and uh, John O'Keefe's girlfriend, Karen Reed, and they drove around and they discovered Mr. O'Keefe uh, on the left side of the property. I would call it the east side of the property, uh, unconscious and not breathing in the snow. Now, this area that Sergeant Good uh, directed you to where uh, he indicated Mr. O'Keefe was, you mentioned that it was snowing heavily at this time. Is that correct? It is correct, yes. And about how much snow was on the ground in this area at the time that you initially went over? I would say at least four inches of snow. Now, with reference um, to, as far as you mentioned, sort of uh, processing, um, what, if anything, uh, did you and the other officers do with regard to, to that scene as far as that was concerned? So it was a unique scene because of the weather. <clears throat> um, Sergeant Lake had notified uh, Norfolk County CPAC. Uh, he had advised them that... Um, Objection. Sustained. Uh, I'm sorry, can you uh, rephrase the question, please? Uh, so, Detective so Sergeant Lag had reached out to North County CPAC, correct? That is correct. And what, what is CPAC? Uh, it's uh, the State Police Investigative Unit of the District Attorney's Office, Crime Prevention and Control. And uh, what, if any, as far as that notification is concerned, uh, what is sort of a protocol when you have uh, an unintended death? So, when we have an unintended death, the uh, Norfolk County CPAC unit responds and takes jurisdiction. Um, in this particular case, uh, Mr. O'Keefe was still alive. Uh, so they declined to respond at that time. It may be a term that's pretty well understood, but when you say unattended death, what, what do you mean by that? An unexplained death, a person who was alone at the time of their death. And so at this point, uh, no one from the state police had responded or was responding to the scene at that point. That is correct. And so what, if anything, uh, did you and the other officers do with regard to the scene where Mr. O'Keefe uh, had been located in the snow? So we decided on how we were going to process the area. Our concern was there were some uh, light pink spots in the snow, and uh, we thought it may be blood. So we were discussing how to get to that, uh, uncover the blood safely. Uh, we decided we were going to process the scene with a leaf blower. Um, I figured we could um, direct the snow off the area in a controlled fashion. Um, at that time, uh, Sergeant Good volunteered to go get a snowblower. Uh, but what I told him in the meantime, <clears throat> I wanted to photograph the area. I wanted all the cruises away from the house. Um, there was one cruise, I believe, occupied Officer Sarif directly in front of where Mr. O'Keefe was. I wanted him backed up. And uh, there was crime scene tape set up. And it was blowing wild, wildly in the uh, wind. It was serving no, pur no purpose at that time. Uh, there were no civilians or witnesses about. Uh, 
and I knew we had two offices who could protect the scene while we processed it. Um, so Sergeant Good, before he left to get the leaf blower, he directed the officers to move their cruisers. Uh, I told Sergeant Lank the most important thing he could do at this time would... Objection. The, the objection sustained. Move on to your next question, Mr. Lally. Now, you mentioned that there was some uh, crime scene tape that was set up around. Is that correct? That is correct. And how was that sort of, how was that accomplished? Uh, Sergeant Good and, uh, and my Detective Sergeant Lank uh, put out the crime scene tape. Do you know what, if anything, they were able to uh, use to attach it to in order to set it up around where they're still keeping the found? I believe they used a fire hydrant, a tree, a flagpole, and I'm not sure what else. I wasn't, I wasn't, I don't recall specifically what it was attached to. And with regard, you mentioned uh, there were photographs that were taken prior to um, the implementation of a leaf blower. Is that correct? That is correct. And I can just ask a little bit about that. As far as the leaf blower was concerned, why was that um, a decision as far as that being an implement to, to use in this particular scene? Uh, it was a unique scene. Um, there was snow. I have, had never processed a scene in the snow. I had seen a leaf blower used in the snow, and it's quite effective at uh, being controlled. Um, so that's why I, it was readily accessible. Um, the scene was uh, debilitating as, as we uh, were on scene with the weather. Uh, snow was piling up, uh, and I thought that was the best method uh, at that time. And prior to the arrival uh, of Sergeant Good back to the scene with the lead blower, what, if anything else, was done to sort of document the scene at that time? Um, in addition to photographs, uh, what we did was <clears throat> I wasn't sure how the roadway ended. I wasn't sure if there was a sidewalk, a curb, a berm, or whether it was just glass, uh, grass. Excuse me. Um, so Sergeant Lank and I uh, dug out um, what I believe is called a six-inch Cape Cod asphalt berm, exposed it so we could get a better perspective of how far Mr. O'Keefe might have been in, uh, off the roadway. May I approach the witness? Yes. So I'm going to direct your attention. Direct your attention what's commonly marked as uh, is it a 7, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 1, 22, and 23. Please uh, review those yourself and look up on your screen. Okay. <clears throat> Your Honor, um, may we approach this briefly? Sure. <clears throat> Mr. Lally, hold on for a sec. No, I'll see counsel again at sidebar on this issue. Yes. <clears throat> Juris, I had told you before how important it is that our record is clear, and that's why I'm sort of making making this uh, take longer than it would otherwise. So.
Ms. Delali, can you simply hand her a note telling her what numbers? Yes, Your Honor, I'm just writing the numbers. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. But I would ask that the next 13 exhibits be marked. The next 13 photographs in the book be marked as the next 13 exhibits. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you can publish them, Mr. Lally. Thank you. May I return them to the witness as well? Yes. Gentlemen, if I could have uh, the first of those photographs up on the screen. If you could enlarge that, just a bit more. 
Yeah, Lieutenant, I don't believe that's the first photograph for you, but uh, if you could locate that within the uh, sure. file. <coughs> I believe that's Exhibit 30. If you could just describe to the jury what, what, if anything, we're looking at in this. So that is in front of 34 Fairview Road in Canton. It's looking westerly or the direction uh, towards Chapman Street, and it's documenting the conditions at the time. May I approach the witness, John? Yes. Mr. Chairman, at any point, uh, if I ask already, this is a legal point. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, Ms. Gilman, if I could have the uh, next photograph, please. simply documenting that uh, the number 34 is on the mailbox. That is 34 Fairview Road. Do you have a number on that in front of you? Yes, I do. It's Exhibit 22. Thank you. There, there are two of these, I believe, or similar. I just want to make sure I have the correct one. 22. That would be 22, yes. And what's depicted in that photograph, sir, is that a fair and accurate portrayal of Sort of the scene in the roadway when you arrived that morning? It is. It's the mailbox with the number 34 on it, and it uh, shows two vehicles in the driveway of 34 Fairview Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ms. Gilman, the next photograph. If you could, Lieutenant, when you locate this, indicate which exhibit we're looking at in this one. That's exhibit 28. It's a different angle of the driveway showing the third car in the driveway. I wanted to document what was in the driveway at that time. Thank you, sir. Next photograph, Ms. Gilman. Exhibit 29, and basically it, it documents the same thing. Um, the entirety of the house from a, I guess it would be a westerly view, uh, and the three cars that were in the driveway at the time I arrived. And uh, the next photograph is coming. That's Exhibit 31, and it's a close-up of where Mr. O'Keefe was found. And you can see the very light pink spotting that we thought may be blood, and there was an object uh, in the center as well, which we didn't know what it was at that time. Subsequent, did you learn what that object was? Yes. What did you learn? It was a broken, clear cocktail glass. And the pink spot was uh, frozen or coagulated blood. And uh, the next photograph is coming. That's exhibit 23. And it's basically uh, showing that the um, scene was trampled by rescue workers, witnesses, etc. But you can still see... Uh, you know, the pink spotting in the, in the area where Mr. O'Keefe was. As far as uh, footprints uh, within the snow that you observed, uh, you indicated that the scene was trampled or walked over by first responders, correct? Correct. And the footprint that you observed, um, what footprints have you, uh, so what, what areas around where Mr. O'Keefe's where, where it was indicated to you that Mr. O'Keefe's body was, where those footprints located? They were located between the street and uh, where Mr. O'Keefe was found. 
And as far as between where Mr. O'Keefe was found and the house or the residence of 34 Fairview, what, if any, footprints did you observe in that area? I, I didn't observe any footprints at that time. Uh, Ms. Gilman, if I could ask for the next photograph, please. That is Exhibit 24, and it's uh, showing a westerly shot of um, the scene. Um, it's found in this area here, and it depicts the wind blowing in that direction at the time. And probably pretty self-evident, but it depicts the wind blowing in that direction based on what? The other flag flying. Uh, the next photograph, Ms. Gilman. That is Exhibit 20. That is the six, I believe it's called a six inch Cape Cod asphalt berm that separated the roadway uh, from the property of 34 Fairview. And this is the long look uh, to where Mr. O'Keefe was discovered. <coughs> The uh, next photograph, Ms. Gilman. Again, that's a, a close-up of uh, one of the exhibits we saw earlier. Again, you can see the spotting and the glass here. Uh, this is, uh, I believe this is exhibit 26. So, uh, next photograph, Ms. Gilman. This is Exhibit 27, and it's uh, some, what we believed was frozen or coagulated uh, blood spotting. Next photograph, Ms. Gilman. <laughs> And that's a, a, a different view, close up of the scene, and that's exhibit 32. And the next photograph, Ms. Gilman. That's when we first uncovered the uh, berm, the six inch berm. And it's just a, a smaller picture, uh, close up of that berm. It's exhibit 25. Reference to the sort of uncovering of the berm as you've described it, what, if anything, did you use to, to uncover the berm? I believe we just used our foot to uncover that. And what I believe is uh, the last photograph. This is uh, the location from the berm to where Mr. O'Keefe was found. It's just a long view, and it's Exhibit 21. May I approach on just Yes. Yes. Tori. <laughs> now, as far as the Cruisers with the Canton Police Department, uh, what if any sort of uh, recording equipment are they equipped with? Uh, they're with dash cameras, uh, watch guide cameras. And have, or what if anything have you done to, to review uh, some of that dash camera uh, footage from the cruisers, from that level? Um, I've reviewed all of it. And specifically, have you reviewed um, dash camera footage uh, from... From uh, the 683 cruiser officer, Sarah's cruiser? Yes, I did. And <clears throat> I 
Your Honor, if I may, uh, I would ask that the, that's already been marked as Exhibit 12. Um, I would ask that a portion of that be played for the jury at this time. Okay. Ms. Gilman, if you could uh, fast forward this to approximately uh, 57 minutes or so uh, into the. That's the video I referred of uh, Kitten Cruiser 683 on, it's dated uh, January 29th, 2022 at uh, 7, if the time is correct, 702.54. And around this time within this video of from Officer Sarah's Cruiser, what, if anything, did you observe occurring within, uh, within that cruiser camera? I believe it's at approximately 57.17. You'll see Sergeant Good. Uh, begin to uh, mark out the scene with a crime, yellow crime scene tape. You'll see him in front of the cruiser at first. Uh, him, Officer Mullaney, and Sergeant Lank uh, walk off, and then you'll see uh, Sergeant Good stretching out the crime scene tape. And uh, if you could, sir, as the video is playing, using the uh, uh, major point of the jam before you, uh, just draw the jury's attention to who, if anyone, you observe or recognize uh, within that video. Yes. <clears throat> The yellow tape it is. There's two offices with uh, yellow crime scene tape. I believe this is Officer of Mulaney, but, but I'm not sure. I know this is uh, Sergeant Good. Uh, and my apologies, Ms. Gilman, if you could play again. <laughs> That's Detective Sergeant Lank in the lighter coat. Uh, Sergeant Good and Lank, they watch walk off camera. See Sergeant Good come into the picture right here. It's stretching out the crime scene tape. You can see it flapping in the wind there. You can see it raise way up because of the wind. This is the crime scene tape here. And I'm not sure what they affixed it to, whether it was the cruiser at that point or not. But you can see the crime scene tape uh, going across the scene that way. <clears throat> Ms. Gilman, if you could pause it right there for a moment. Um, so, Lieutenant Gallagher, um, in addition to sort of the, the crime scene tape that you observe in this video, what, if anything else, did you get from the station to uh, attempt to sort of uh, secure the scene or uh, place at the scene? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Did you get a tent at the station? Excuse me? A tent at the station? No, I didn't. You didn't? Okay. No. And why not? Uh, I had a tent with me uh, from home. It was a personal 8x8 tent at that time. My apologies. And so at any point in time on the scene, were you able to set up that tent that you uh, retrieved from your home? Uh, due to the weather conditions, we did not set it up because it would have required officers holding it down, and we didn't think the top would stay on. And uh, again, maybe pretty self-evident, but when you say due to the weather conditions, what, if anything, about the weather conditions prevented you from, from setting that tent up over the uh, There was high winds, uh, shifting directions, uh, a large amount of snow falling. Uh, Ms. Kilman, if I could ask, uh, if you could just 
pull forward in that video to about the one hour, seven minute mark. Lieutenant, what if anything are we looking at in this portion? Uh, if you look closely, it's the uh, crime scene tape that's flowing around. Right now, you can't see it. Or I cannot see it from here. Is this around the point where the decision was made to, to take that down? Is that correct? Uh, it was later on. I, I observed the same thing, and I told the officers it wasn't doing any good at that time. And there were no nobody to keep out of the scene at that point. It was only police personnel on scene. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm just coming. You can stop and take it down. Thank you very much. Now, with reference to the um, implementation of, of the leaf um was that memorialized in any way as well? Yes, I had Sergeant Good uh, take a video uh, since we were improvising using something I, I wasn't familiar with being used before in case there were any questions on how it was deployed. Um, I had Sergeant Good take a short video. And uh, there's for several different short video clips of that process, is that fair to say? Um, there's at least one that I know of. Uh, may I approach? Yes. <clears throat> I don't I don't recognize it. I haven't seen this just before. Um. <clears throat> oh, may we approach? <laughs> Okay. Thank you. My biggest apologies, Your Honor. May we approach this briefly? Okay. Joyce, feel free to stay. Your Honor, with the court's permission, may I publish uh, what's now been marked as 30. The last exhibit says, uh, if I could publish that for Yes. Anyway, this is one third. I'm oh, sorry, Ms. Cameron, if you could just pause it right there. And Lieutenant Gallagher, do you recognize what's, what's up on screen? I do. And uh, what do you recognize? Uh, it's me uh, operating the leaf blower and at the scene where uh, John O'Keefe was discovered. And who, who is operating the leaf blower in these videos? I am. 
and who, if anyone else from your department, is sort of present while this this process is going. Uh, Detective Sergeant Link is documenting, and uh, Sergeant Good is also assisting. Uh, and Ms. Gilman, thank you very much. If you could just uh, play him right. You see, it's uh, it removes the snow. I was removing the snow layer by layer, and right here, <clears throat> you can see it exposing the cocktail glass. You're going to see red spots appear <clears throat> as I remove it layer by layer. These pink spots start to turn to be dark red spots. As you see, we can control it. Uh, we were concerned with whatever other. Oh, hold on and wait for a question. As you can see, it just takes it layer by layer. Hold, hold on for a second. Mr. Lally, Ms. Gilman, can you pause it? So if you have a question for um, the lieutenant, all right, you're asking him to narrate the whole thing. We're not going to do it that way. And you can pause and, and then question. It's a little, it's great you're keeping your voice up over the sound of the leaf blower, but it's a little distracting. I understand, y'all. So do you have a question, Mr. Lally? Just briefly at this point. So Lieutenant Gallagher, with, with respect to as you're conducting this sort of process, what, if anything, are you concerned about as far as uh, the, throughout this process of trying to locate evidence? There? Uh, were we concerned with the weather destroying biological evidence at that time? Um, and uh, so what, if anything, were you doing with the garden? Uh, we were trying to take the... Uh, the snow that had fallen over the blood, and we were trying to remove it to expose the blood. And fair to say, as far as during this sort of removal process, how much of the snow were you able to, to sort of sift layer by layer with the leaf blower that you had? Uh, we could control how much we, I wanted to sift. Uh, I did it as, I started out as gently as possible, and uh, if it needed, uh, more snow needed to be removed, I, I got a little more aggressive. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Gilman, if you could, uh, good
Uh, and Mr. Officer, you can put the lights on. There. Thanks. Uh, Lieutenant, with reference to that process, um, how far deep into the snow were you able to, uh, to go with, with using that leaf blower in that van? Uh, we get almost to the ground, bare ground. And as far as sort of a, a surface area, like how, how much of, of that area where Mr. O'Keefe uh, was found were you able to, to use the leaf blower on? I, it was approximately a six by six, seven by seven type area. And uh, from that area, what, if anything, in addition to the cocktail blast pieces that you uh, already testified to and the uh, red spots on the ground, what, if anything else, did you observe? Yeah, we didn't observe anything at that point, anything else, just the blood in the glass. Now, Lieutenant, during the time that you were on scene, um, with reference to uh, the neighborhood in general, um, how many people did you observe sort of come out of their house at any point in time that you were I didn't observe anybody ever come out of their house. And that includes the residents that you were in front of as well as any other residences along that street, is that correct? That is correct. Now, at some point, um, about how long a period of time, if you know, were you, were you on scene that particular morning? Approximately uh, 50 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes. And following that, where did you go? Uh, we brought the uh, exhibits back to Camp Police Headquarters. And by that, you mean the glass and, and what you would collect of the blood? Yep, we took six blood samples, yes. Okay, and how were you able to sort of collect the, the blood samples on scene? Well, the blood samples, because they were frozen, uh, we debated on um, how to collect it. Uh, we didn't think swabbing was going to be uh, easy to do if it was frozen. So uh, we decided on finding some type of pl temporary plastic evidence container. Uh, we were able to uh, find large uh, cups and we took six samples. We bagged the six samples and Sergeant Lank uh, transported them back to Canton Police Headquarters. And with respect to those samples and uh, piece of glass that you located, eventually, what if anything was done uh, with those? Well, first and foremost, when you came back to Canton Police Station, what if anything uh, did you do with them there? Uh, Chief Berkowitz was uh, at headquarters, and we had a meeting in the detective sergeant's office. Uh, what I'm asking, sir, is with reference to those items that you took back from Fairview, when you got back to the station, what, if anything, did you do? Uh, sergeant Lank placed them into evidence. And then subsequent to Sergeant Lank placing them into evidence at some point, where did they go? They were turned over on February 1st to the uh, Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab. And... Was that something where they were driven to the crime lab, or did the crime lab come to the station? The crime lab was already at the station. Now, you go back to uh, the police station and have some conversation uh, with your chief, is that correct? That is correct. And what was your chief's name? Uh, chief Berkowitz, Kenneth Berkowitz. And um, following that conversation, at some point, uh, did you return to Fairview Road that morning? I did. And who, if anyone, did you go there with? I accompanied uh, Detective Sergeant Lank. And when you arrived, uh, where did you go with reference to residents? Um, we went into a side door, and there were people in the kitchen at that time. I believe it was the kitchen area. And did you know any of the people that were in the kitchen? I did. Who, if anyone, did you know? Uh, who I remember specifically uh, was Jen McCabe, who, who I don't know personally, but I know because that's who Sergeant Lank uh, arrived to talk to, and I knew Brian Albert in a professional sense. And so Brian Albert is also a police officer, is that correct? He was Boston police officer, yes. Now, as far as any other people, uh, who if anyone else were you introduced to when you came into the kitchen area? And all? I wasn't introduced to anybody. I, all I know is there were five or six people there. And uh, are you familiar with a gentleman by the name of uh, Brian Higgins? I am. And how are you familiar with him? Uh, he is uh, an ATF agent who I've worked with when I was assigned to DEA, and he later uh, had a satellite office at our PD, and I have since uh, come to know him personally. And uh, in reference to your work with the DEA, how long did you work with the DEA? 13 years. And so... Mr. Higgins, was he present in the home on Fairview when you arrived there that morning? 
I don't recall him. Uh, when I arrived originally, definitely not. I, I don't recall if he was there when we arrived about 9 a.m. So you don't recall him being there at all? I don't recall specifically. I never had any conversation with him. Now, you had made some mention of uh, February 1st, a few days later, uh, at your department, uh, there were members from the crime lab that came, correct? That is correct. And um, what, if anything, did they come there to do? Uh, they were assisting the uh, state police at executing a search warrant on a motor vehicle. And where was that motor vehicle in relation to uh, your car? It was in our Sally Port. If you could just describe to the jury, sort of what, what is the Sally Port specifically at the can police? Like, where is it located? What does it look like? Sure. It's on the uh, rear portion of our police department. Uh, they are large overhead doors that are numbered. Uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, we only have two bays. Uh, so the uh, Sally Port uh, that the vehicle was in, typically uh, we enter through door four and you would exit through door three. Uh, those doors, overhead doors, can only be controlled by a computer in the dispatch center. And it's uh, where we bring in our prisoners. Uh, once the Sally Port goes up, you enter, close the door, the area is secure. Um, the rest of the PD is only accessible by uh, access card, key access card. As you mentioned, sort of the overhead garage doors are accessible only by the dispatch area, is that correct? That, that is correct, a computer in the dispatch <clears throat> area. And then as far as uh, entrance from the department, how, how is it all is that controlled? Uh, there is a, uh, uh, to the right of Sally Port 4, there is a key card access door. Now, with reference uh, to that Sally Port area, is there, what if any uh, cameras are located in that area? I know there's cameras in the area. I don't specifically know where they are. I, I typically don't look for them. I know it is under uh, surveillance, as most of our department is. And have you reviewed... Um, the at least portion or, or the entirety of uh, the, the Sally Court video from that particular day of February 1st? I've seen a small portion, yes. May I approach the witness, Sean? Yes. Uh, what's depicted on that uh, particular flash drive? Yes. Okay. What is uh, what is depicted on that, sir? CPD uh, Sally Port videos. You know, I call what the state introduced in a minute as an exhibit. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Hmm? Sorry, if I may at this time uh, I seek to publish a portion of Exhibit 34 for the jury. Okay. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Yes. So, Ms. Kilman, if I could have the portion that's February 1st uh, that covers uh, 12 a.m. to 12 noon.
Yeah, you the two one bottom. Um, yeah. Ms. Gilman, if I could ask you to just uh, fast forward that to approximately 9, 11 a.m. Why don't we take our morning recess? Why don't we take a 10, 15 minute recess? So we're still in session. So in um, presenting the exhibits um, for to, to be marked, please take them out of the plastic and out of the envelopes because the actual item itself gets a sticker on it. That'll just save a little time. Um, we're having all sorts of difficulties. FTR is not working. I'm not sure that we're getting any internet in here. Uh, are we all set with this? Do you, can, is this something? Do you want to use the flash drive that you put in? Does that help? Or are you? No, I, I think it, the initial issue, I think, is, is sort of the size of the video. Um, so bringing it up can be a little. My, my issue was that as I was standing over there, I couldn't really see anything yeah. as far as the screen. It's, it's it dark. That dark when you I, put it on. I couldn't open any of this this weekend on my home computer, on my work computer. So, all right, why don't we take a 10-minute recess? All right, the court, please. More raw courtroom coverage of the trial of Karen Reed is coming up from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Press subscribe so you don't miss a minute.